Henry VIII is a collaborative history play, written by William Shakespeare and John Fletcher, based on the life of Henry VIII. An alternative title, All is True, is recorded in contemporary documents, with the title Henry VIII not appearing until the play's publication in the first folio of 1623. Stylistic evidence indicates that individual scenes were written by either Shakespeare or his collaborator and successor, John Fletcher. It is also somewhat characteristic of the late romances in its structure. It is noted for having more stage directions than any of Shakespeare's other plays. During a performance of Henry VIII at the Globe Theatre in 1613, a cannon shot employed for special effects ignited the theatre's thatched roof and the beams burning the original Globe building to the ground. Summary The play opens with a prologue by a figure otherwise unidentified, who stresses that the audience will see a serious play, and appeals to the audience members, the first and happiest hearers of the town, to be sad, as we would make ye. Act 1 opens with a conversation between the Dukes of Norfolk and Buckingham and Lord Abergavenny. Their speeches express their mutual resentment over the ruthless power and overweening pride of Cardinal Wolsey. Wolsey passes over the stage with his attendants, and expresses his own hostility toward Buckingham. Later Buckingham is arrested on treason charges, Wolsey's doing. The play's second scene introduces King Henry VIII, and shows his reliance on Wolsey as his favorite. Queen Catherine enters to protest about Wolsey's abuse of the tax system for his own purposes, Wolsey defends himself, but when the king revokes the cardinal's measures, Wolsey spreads a rumor that he himself is responsible for the king's action. Catherine also challenges the arrest of Buckingham, but Wolsey defends the arrest by producing the duke's surveyor, the primary accuser. After hearing the surveyor, the king orders Buckingham's trial to occur. At a banquet thrown by Wolsey, the king and his attendants enter in disguise as maskers. The king dances with Anne Bullen. Two anonymous gentlemen open Act 2, one giving the other an account of Buckingham's treason trial. Buckingham himself enters in custody after his conviction, and makes his farewells to his followers and to the public. After his exit, the two gentlemen talk about court gossip, especially Wolsey's hostility toward Catherine. The next scene shows Wolsey beginning to move against the Queen, while the nobles Norfolk and Suffolk look on critically. Wolsey introduces Cardinal Campius and Gardiner to the King, Campius has come to serve as a judge in the trial Wolsey is arranging for Catherine. Anne Bullen is shown conversing with the old lady who is her attendant. Anne expresses her sympathy at the Queen's troubles, but then the Lord Chamberlain enters to inform her that the King has made her Marchioness of Pembroke. Once the Lord Chamberlain leaves, the old lady jokes about Anne's sudden advancement in the king's favor. Alavishly staged trial scene, Act 2 Scene 4, portrays Catherine's hearing before the king and his courtiers. Catherine reproaches Wolsey for his machinations against her, and refuses to stay for the proceedings. But the king defends Wolsey, and states that it was his own doubts about the legitimacy of their marriage that led to the trial. Campius protests that the hearing cannot continue in the Queen's absence, and the King grudgingly adjourns the proceeding. Act 3 Wolsey and Campius confront Catherine among her ladies in waiting, Catherine makes an emotional protest about her treatment. Norfolk, Suffolk, Surrey, and the Lord Chamberlain are shown, Act 3 Scene 2, plotting against Wolsey. A packet of Wolsey's letters to the Pope have been redirected to the King, the letters show that Wolsey is playing a double game, opposing Henry's planned divorce from Catherine to the Pope while supporting it to the King. The King shows Wolsey his displeasure, and Wolsey for the first time realizes that he has lost Henry's favor. The nobleman mock Wolsey, and the Cardinal sends his follower Cromwell away so that Cromwell will not be brought down in Wolsey's fall from grace. The two gentlemen return in Act 4 to observe and comment upon the lavish procession for Anne Bullen's coronation as queen, which passes over the stage in their presence. Afterward they are joined by a third gentleman, who updates them on more court gossip the rise of Thomas Cromwell in royal favor, and plots against Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Scene 2 Catherine is shown ill, is told of Wolsey's death, has a vision of dancing spirits. Caputius visits her. Catherine expresses her continuing loyalty to the king, despite the divorce, and wishes the new queen well. Act 5. The king summons Anervis Cranmer to his presence, and expresses his support. Later, when Cranmer is shown disrespect by the king's council, Henry reproves them and displays his favor of the churchmen. Anne Bullen gives birth to a daughter, the future Queen Elizabeth. 
In the play's closing scenes, the porter and his man complain about trying to control the massive and enthusiastic crowds that attend the infant Elizabeth's christening, another lush procession is followed by a prediction of the glories of the newborn princess's future reign and that of her successor. The epilogue, acknowledging that the play is unlikely to please everyone, asks. Nonetheless for the audience's approval. Characters. Prologue, epilogue. Henry VIII King of England. Cardinal Wolsey Archbishop of York and Lord Chancellor, initially, Henry's chief advisor. Queen Catherine later divorced. Anne Bullen Catherine's maid of honor, later Queen Anne, a. Uh. Duke of Buckingham hates Wolsey, who charges him with treason. Thomas Cranmer Archbishop of Canterbury, replaces Wolsey as Henry's chief advisor. Stephen Gardiner close ally of Wolsey, King's secretary, later Bishop of Winchester. Lord Chamberlain Historically, the play covers a period in which the position was held by both Somerset and Lord Sands, but the play presents the character as one consistent figure, five Duke of Norfolk Anne Bullen's grandfather, later Earl Marshall. Duke of Suffolk Henry's brother-in-law, later High Steward. Earl of Surrey Buckingham's son-in-law and Norfolk's son, also Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Cardinal Campius Papal Legate sent to judge legitimacy of Henry's marriage to Catherine. Caputius Ambassador of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor Catherine's nephew. Sir Thomas Cromwell Wolsey's secretary and protege, later secretary to the Privy Council. Lord Sands historically, was Lord Chamberlain during some of the period covered by the play 5. Lord Abergavenny Buckingham's son-in-law. Lord Chancellor Thomas More. More replaces Wolsey, after which time he is never mentioned by name. 6 Thomas Audley, 1st Baron Audley of Walden replaced Moore. Bishop of Lincoln. Sir Thomas Lovell Chancellor of the Exchequer. Sir Henry Guilford Master of the Horse. Sir Nicholas Vaux Governor of Guines. Sir Anthony Denny Groom of the Stool. Dr. Butts Henry's Personal Physician. Griffith Catherine's Usher. Garter King of Arms. Buckingham Surveyor Historically, Charles Nevitt V. Brandon and Officer B. Sergeant at Arms. Porter. Old Lady Bullen's Chaperone. Patience Catherine's Waiting Woman. Doorkeeper of the Council Chamber. First Secretary Works for Wolsey. Second Secretary Works for Wolsey. First Scribe at Catherine's Trial. Second Scribe at Catherine's Trial. Crier. Gardener's Page. Three Gentlemen. Lord Chamberlain's Servant. Porter's Man. Messenger. At the Legatine Court. Archbishop of Canterbury predecessor of Thomas Cranmer non-speaking role Bishop of Ely non-speaking role Bishop of Rochester non-speaking role Bishop of St Asaph non-speaking role At Bullen's coronation Marquis Dorset non-speaking role Bishop of London non-speaking role Lord Mayor of London historically Sir Stephen Peacock nine non-speaking role At Elizabeth's christening Infant Princess Elizabeth, non-speaking role. Marchioness Dorset Elizabeth's godmother, non-speaking role. Duchess of Norfolk Elizabeth's godmother, non-speaking role.